Hey everyone, it's Ariana from the blog and here we are and it is Q&A Wednesday when I look at some of the questions you have from me and do my best to answer them um, and I just enjoy chatting with you. So uh, today's question is coming from Sarah Eileen and she asked, I want to know how you started foraging, who have you learned from and some of your wild, favorite wild things to eat. Well, um, foraging is one of my favorite things to talk about because um, first of all, not very many people ask me about it and I feel like a huge dork trying to share my enthusiasm for eating wild food with people who aren't so interested maybe or just think it's a really weird thing to spend your time doing. Um, but I think foraging is just so fantastic. I mean, nature gives us so many great gifts for food and medicine and it's really wonderful to be able to take advantage of them. So um, some background about um, maybe what um, gave me my adventurous attitude or piqued my interest in foraging uh, personally is that um, I grew up in the Philippines um, from ages 8 to 18 and people pick and eat a lot of food, <laughs> most food. Um, I'm sure that's changing now with supermarkets and things like that, but um, I, I literally did spend um, hours and hours um, climbing trees and hanging out in trees and picking fruit and eating them right there um, in the trees. And um, of course, there's lots of uh, traditional wisdom about which plants to use for different ailments and um, our helpers kind of brought a lot of that knowledge into the house. But uh, before that even, my mom um, was really into herbalism and kind of unconventional stuff. So I think she just imparted a real curiosity about nature and that knowledge that uh, we can find medicine um, from the plants growing around us. So in the state, when, when I got back to um, the US after graduating from high school, I was living in Southern California and to be honest, I didn't really forage anything there. I, I didn't really know what was edible in the landscape, and I was busy with all sorts of other things. And uh, even, I guess, in Portland, I mean, I, I when we moved to Portland, Oregon, I guess that there are, you know, lots of nettles and things like that there, but I never saw them um, because I just didn't have the eyes for it. And so if you were thinking that, you know, you just can't really identify any plants and it seems kind of hard to get into. Uh, I just don't think that that is really um, a very good excuse for for um, not getting started with foraging because we just sort of train our eyes to see what's around us and, and you learn um, plant literacy just like you learn anything else like speaking another language you know you can you can pick out some big words at first um, and then more and more words start filling in and pretty soon you're you know you can understand what someone is saying and it's the same you know if you if you go for walks and you see the same plants over and over again you might look them up sometime or if you just sort of surround yourself with that knowledge by looking at different books or following different blogs where they're foraging um, or even um, I subscribe to some Facebook pages that are geared toward wild edibles and so as I you know just kind of go about life I see these plants and I see them in pictures um, and then sooner or later when I'm taking a walk I see a new plant that I recognize that I just never noticed before and I'm sure that it was always there but I just hadn't seen it. So there are a few ways to get started. I just mentioned kind of finding those resources to give you exposure to some wild edibles in your area. Um, of course some books are good and I'll show you which books I have. I think um, the first one I got maybe was Alice Fowler, The Thrifty Forager. It's kind of a, it's like a really easy book. It's really fun and there's charts and um, different different pictures and things that will help you kind of pick out the most obvious things. And I'd say it's a really kind of fun, interesting book to get, um, to just sort of get your feet wet and see what's out there. The next book, um, I actually got two versions of the same book and it's because um, this one, Food for Free, it's fantastic. I really like it. Oops, here we go. And um, even though it's um, written by an Englishman, um, a lot of the plants and things will be similar in the U.S. and Canada. So I'd say it's a pretty good universal book. And the reason why I love it is because it has really big pictures. 
and often shows things in different stages. I'm sorry, figuring out this camera angle thing. Um, and kind of describes things pretty clearly. And sometimes, oops, includes recipes and ways to use them. And then um, I like this one, but it's not really practical to shove into your backpack when you're taking a walk. So I have the pocket version, sorry, pocket version as well of Food for Free. And this one doesn't have photos, it has illustrations. And we have used this one a ton. I would definitely recommend finding a good regional guide or two or three for where you live. And um, those are really easy to find, um, especially on Amazon or something like that. Um, and then of course, you may have read my review for foraging and feasting. And this is also a great one. Um, she explains, you know, the basics of foraging and has lots of different ideas for how to use your um, foraged foods. And um, I learned some really great ideas from her about things you can do with them. And then she also shows you the different stages of the plant so you'll know what to look for at different times of the year. Um, so these are the ones that I have and use and I really love them. And let's see, something that comes up a lot is, aren't you afraid you're gonna poison yourself and your family? Um, yeah, <laughs> I am, um, but it's a healthy fear. It's not a fear that keeps me from um, actually going and doing it. It's just the fear that um, motivates me to check what I'm about to eat about four times um, and to not eat it if I'm not totally sure. So um, there are some foods that I think would be really nice to eat, but I am not confident enough to make sure that, um, it, you know, for example, if it's something in the family that can easily be confused with hemlock or fool's parsley or some things that are really deadly poisonous, um, there may be some similar plants that are really delicious and I would just as soon not eat them at this point and especially because I am foraging with an eight uh, seven year old and um, Amelia is really good at you know identifying plants by now just from exposure but I don't want her to see me grabbing a plant and eating it or giving it to her and then her seeing something that really looks super similar and grows in a similar place and it'd be poisonous and her eating it. So um, there are, you know, you have to be really smart about it, but I, I would say don't let that keep you. I would just say check, double check, check again, check once more. And sometimes I'll find something as I'm going along and I think it's something, but I'm not sure. And so I'll just pull out my, um, I'll pull up my, my phone and take a few pictures and then I or I pick some leaves of it um, and don't eat it and just take it home and then I can um, look it up and I can you know figure out how to identify it properly find out if there are any look-alikes maybe if it if I find that it's an edible um, then I need to also find out if there is something that looks similar that could be mistaken, which is poisonous. And I, I find all of that out first um, before we eat, and especially when it comes to mushrooms. Uh, we don't eat tons of different mushrooms because I'm so darn scared of making a mistake. But we have, uh, let's see, I think we've probably brought home and eaten about five different kinds that I was able to really confidently identify and be sure that there was nothing we could be mistaking them for. Um, and so that was that was cool. Uh, but at the same time, I feel like, man, you know, I I don't want to. Um, it's not. It's just not how I want to die, and it's not worth it. So so we're very careful foragers and we don't take risks with eating things that we're not sure about. That said, I mean, there are so many things that you can pick with full confidence and know that it's edible and it's not poisonous and you can enjoy it and it's a great food. So, um, so you know, be smart. Um, don't eat something that you don't know for sure and uh, still go out and do it and, and learn as you go because seriously, it's so interesting 
and it's such a great way to spend your time and it's good food uh, it's good family time together and for me one of the things that I feel like is really important um, as far as life skills goes is teaching my daughter how to find food um, you know I don't know what's coming in the future and I am a total optimist and so I'm it doesn't come from a place of of fear and worry, but a really strong sense of uh, practicality that uh, people need to know how to get food if they don't have a supermarket available for some reason, or even if they do. Um, you know, nature provides so many resources. There's food all around us, and there's great nutrition and great herbal medicinal properties to be had, and it's just right there, and we walk right past it. And I see it as just pure grace, you know, why not welcome that into your life? And um, I, I believe that we're made to have a real connection with plants um, and that they really do take care of us. And so um, it's really important to me to be receiving that into, into my body and also just to teach Amelia, you know, these are plants you can eat and this is how you find them, this is how you prepare them. And of course, that comes along with, you know, teaching her normal um, traditional kitchen skills, um, how to cook for herself, how to, you know, how to make the food happen uh, in the absence of an easy resource. So um, foraging is definitely something I think that everyone should look into. It's just very cool, very fun, and very good for you. And of course, it's totally free. And I cannot, um, I cannot leave it unsaid that you have to be really respectful if you want to take advantage of the resources of nature. Um, never overpick an area. Um, never pick in an area that you don't know if it's okay for you to do that or not. Ask the owner's permission. Here in England, we have a lot of freedom. Um, most, most land, we have a right to walk through. Um, there's some land passage rights here that make that really wonderful and most food um, can be picked except there are certain rules There are basically sort of endangered species of plants that were over foraged in the past and we are also not allowed to pull up plants by the root without the landowner's permission so that gives us a lot of freedom and um, the other thing is that you should definitely, you know, thank God and thank nature when you take plants. Um, I think that is just good practice and allows you to do that with the right attitude. You're not pillaging. Um, you are receiving gifts. And um, the other thing, oh, I forgot it. What was it? So part of Sarah's question was, what are my favorites? Well, um, two things we use more than others are the, um, the nettles plant, and we use that in so many ways. We can use it as an herb and make tea with it. We can brew beer with it, which is fantastic. We make sort of like an IPA um, without any grains in it for people who don't do grains. Um, that was really fantastic. And we use it like spinach, you know, and I, it's one of the greens that I've been able to take and then sort of blanch and puree and freeze to use through the year. And we've done that and it can be such a nice thing to pull out of the freezer and add to a soup. So we love nettles and we love the elder tree because they have um, flowers in the spring and summer, which is they're in flower right now and wonderful elderberries in the fall. So we have made elderflower soda and elderflower wine. I'm making elderflower champagne and soda right now. And you can make an elderflower cordial or do something sort of more like a lemonade with it. And um, all of those are really good. Um, the, other, the other things that you can do, of course, are using the elderberries and they are a really great antiviral medicine. So we've made um, elderberry tonic is like a like a flu sort of medicine and um, super good for boosting your immune system and then my very favorite thing of all the wild sort of things we've made was elderberry wine we made um, elderberry wine was the first sort of homemade wine that I tried and I didn't know what I was doing and I just kind of winged it and it turned out to be really fantastic so um, 
We made a much, much larger batch last fall and we're saving it to open um, at the end of the year this year. And of course this fall we'll be making probably as much as we possibly can. <laughs> so, um, so nettles and elder flowers and elderberries are great. And then this year we started eating garlic mustard um, and that was really good. And you know, every, every year that we've been doing this, we have definitely expanded sort of our repertoire of which foods we can pick and which ones we can identify and how we use them. Um, and something that I'm really looking forward to right now is cherry season. Last year, we realized that um, there were all of these cherry trees all over the place, even you know in our neighborhood, and no one was picking them. I mean, it's more cherries than the birds could eat. It was just crazy to me. And so we ended up picking just, I mean, buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of cherries. And we, I mean, some of them were, you know, not great to eat, like right off the tree, but there's so much that you can do with them. And so we made cherry soda and we made cherry wine, which was fantastic. And we did cherry ice cream and all sorts of things. So um, right now we're eagerly awaiting um, the ripening of the cherries in our neighborhood and we'll totally be taking advantage of them. Um, and apples just fall on the ground all over the place here. They're planted in you know, parks, but in woods kind of where people aren't really walking very much. And, and all of this fruit just goes to waste every year. Um, so we feel really good about going through and picking it. And I almost have this sort of moral imperative to go use the food, you know, that is just falling to the ground unused. Um, so it keeps us busy for sure uh, in the summer and fall. And it's a lot of fun. It's free food. It's good. It's interesting. You know, the a lot of the varieties of trees um, are not, you know, a lot of them are wild. And so the flavor is really very in um, the fruits. And that's really fun too, because we've made you know, some really good cider out of apples that are definitely not good to just eat plain. Um, and we made crab apple cider and all kinds of things. So I'm looking forward to doing more foraging related posts for you this year. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I don't really consider myself an expert, just um, a total enthusiast who continues to learn um, all the time. And I'm always looking for new plants to identify and use. So um, I hope you'll kind of find some things in your area uh, to go look for and to bring home and eat. And um, I'll go ahead and post the links for the books that I shared with you in case you want to check any of those out. And if you have any questions, like I said, just write them in the comments and I'm looking forward to chatting with you all about it. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.